name is Anya and I'm going to be telling the story of my third cousin twice removed, Mary Ellen Joyce. It is an incredible story and it all started with a spoon. In the household of my great uncle, Tommy Joyce, there lay a souvenir spoon with the word Reedsburg written on it. The family were wondering where the spoon had come from when a hazy recollection of relations in America came to mind. They must have lived in Reedsburg and sent the spoon over. Tommy had always been interested in history, in particular his roots in County Mayo. The family tree was mostly completed, but there was a bit missing, the family that had emigrated to America. He completed a bit of research, and with only a spoon, a place name, and hazy family stories to go on, he set out for America with his son Mark. They flew into Reedsburg, Wisconsin, and visited a library which had kept all the local papers from the 1700s onwards. Thousands of newspapers later, they found a few articles on the Joyce family. The pair met a lady who knew the family and brought Mark and Tommy to the local nursing home. The residents here remembered the Joyce family and told a tale of Mary Joyce, who had become quite famous in Alaska. They decided to research her. Patrick E. Joyce married Mary Byrne in 1854, County Mayo, where he lived with her for nine years. They lived on Lord Ardalon's estate in a mud flat before they emigrated to America. They were recorded as landing in New York on the 11th of April. My great-great-grandfather and her grandfather were brothers. Born in 1899 on a farm in Baraboo, Wisconsin, USA, to Martin and Mary Joyce, Mary Ellen Joyce was an adventurer of the highest calibre. At the age of 18 months, her mother died, leaving Mary and her brothers to be raised by an aunt and uncle. Mary attended the Roman Catholic Mercy Academy High School in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mary decided to pursue a career in nursing and graduated from the Mercy Hospital School of Nursing in Chicago, Illinois. She left Wisconsin for Hollywood, California in 1928 in search of an adventure. Drawn by the lure of the growing movie industry, Mary journeyed westward with other friends to Hollywood along what would later become Route 66. She found work as a nurse at Paramount Studios' first aid station and was promoted to technical director for films involving hospital scenes. She even had a small acting part in the silent film Sorrel and Son, whose director was nominated for an Academy Award. However, it was her position as a special duty nurse at Hollywood Hospital that changed the course of her life forever. One morning in 1926, the nursing supervisor warned Mary about her new patient. Don't be surprised if you're dismissed in the morning. She's already fired eight others. To everyone's surprise, this didn't happen and instead she was hired by the patient. She was hired by Mrs. Erie Hackley Smith, heir to the Charles Hackley lumber fortune, as a private nurse for her son. Her son was called Lee Hackley Smith, and was and he was a World War I veteran who suffered from alcoholism and post-war mental health issues. His parents required Mary as a sort of nurse and compa companion for Hack, while they cruised Alaska's inside passage in the family's private yacht, the Stella Maris. Part of the family's journey went through Jonu, and the family were struck with the beauty of the area. The parents purchased the Twin Glacier Camp, located 40 miles northwest of Jonu, on the banks of the Taku River and between two glaciers. It was accessible only by boat or plane. They put Hack in charge with assistance from Mary, reasoning that its location was remote from any source of alcohol and so removed the temptation. Together, Hack and Mary ran the lodge, adding to the facilities and guiding hunting trips. With long winter nights closing in, Hack and Mary decided to start breeding sled dogs. The duo raised and trained huskies as freight animals and for their guests' entertainment. Each spring, Mrs Smith came with a boatload of supplies. They hauled the supplies from the anchored yacht to the shore with a skiff, then up the hill to the lodge using dog power. One shipment included lavender bathroom, bathroom fi fixtures, which are still in the lodge today, and a Jersey cow named Myra, because Mary hated canned milk in her coffee. Myra later developed a strong appetite for salmon, which found its way into the flavour of the milk. Hack died in 1934, only four years after purchasing the lodge. 
In 1934, after being a nurse to Hacksmith for four years and an un unexpected heart attack that took his life, Mary Joyce was deeded the Twin Glacier Camp by the Smiths. Mary renamed the lodge Tacky Glacier Lodge and began successfully operating it as a tourist resort that could accommodate up to 30 guests. While Mary Joyce was running the Tacky Glacier Lodge, she also accepted a position from Pacific Alaska Airways to help coordinate flights from Juneau to Fairbanks. This made her the first female radio operator in Alaska. When she inherited the lodge, she also became the sole caretaker of 15 dogs, which led her on to her next adventure. Taku Lodge was closed in winter, so in the year 1936, when Mary Joyce was invited to take part in the Miss Alaska contest as Miss Junoo at the 1936 Fairbanks Ice Carnival set for March, she decided to attend. But being Mary Joyce, she had to do it her own way. She decided to undertake the thousand mile journey by dog sled through territory previously only traveled to by natives. She started planning her journey, deciding to leave in December to make plenty of time to get there. This meant most of her journey would be through darkness with temperatures to fall below minus 60 degrees. Mary later said that she was glad when it warmed up to minus 40 degrees Celsius. That time of year did offer one advantage. The rivers and lakes she encountered, and there was many, would mostly be frozen and therefore easier to cross. Many thought she was mad and some of the unwelcome comments she received were, but you can't do that. There are mountains or something you can't get over. Anyway, it's no place for a woman. Mary recorded her journey on little index cards, telling of the people, places and animals she encountered on her travels. The route she took was mountainous and one 300 mile section was unmapped. The usual route, the one that many had expected her to take, was 200 miles longer than the one she had in mind. In fact, some of her, some of the parts of, the route, of her route became part of the Alkin Highway later on. Mary didn't ride on the sled. She said her five dogs had enough work just pulling the supplies. In fact, she sometimes walked ahead in snowshoes to break trail for them. During one stretch, she recalled, I do not mind breaking trail when my snowshoes only go down to my knees, but I do resent it when I go down up to my neck and the snow gets in my ears. She was warmly received at villages and homes she stopped at on the way. At one, she wondered why they kept looking at me, and finally one of them said, But you're not at all what we expected. We thought you'd be big and masculine, and you're so little. I told them, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm afraid I'm as big as I can ever hope to be. There was much laughter and friendliness, and I felt immediately that I had known these people all my life. However, there were also times where there was no human-made shelter, and she had to rely on her rag house, a small tent. She encountered many mishaps along the way. As we were rounding the bend, the toboggan started sliding, and I had to steady it, and it went right up to my waist. It was a nuisance having to stop and build a fire. Everything f froze immediately. I even had to thaw out my socks before I could pull them off, and it definitely wasn't too warm changing to corduroy pyjama tops. I had sent my other ski suit to Fairbanks by plane, and now my toboggan was all iced down, making it twice as heavy to pull for the poor dogs. The sun went down. It had gone down in my heart long before. We were going through tundra with a scrub brush here, and there no trees. The Tanana River lay to our right, but where was Tanana crossing? I had not known it would be so far. I did not speak, instead saving my energy to encourage the dogs who now could hardly pull empty sleds. Perhaps they had lost faith in me. The wind started to blow and it got darker. I went on and on with my head down, the dogs following and despair in my heart. It was a blizzard by this time. I had heard of men freezing to death outside their cabin door. Was I to be so close to Tanana Crossing and never get there? Fortunately, that didn't happen, but the harsh conditions and about a bout of flu meant that she was still 250 miles from Fairbanks, just as the ice festival was about to begin. Her journey had been followed with increasing interest by the press, and at one stop, after she had been out of contact for several weeks, she was shown a telegram from the Milwaukee Journal. We'll pay you for a quick exclusive coverage on significant developments in search for Mary Joyce. Stop. Discovery dead or alive. Stop. We'll also pay for exclusive pictures and her story if alive. Stop. The organisers of the Fairbank Ice Carnival insisted she fly there for the Ice Carnival opening. 
For ten days they swept her up in all the activities, after which she flew back and finished the journey. The carnival committee presented her with a silver cup and cajoled her into parading round the main street before attending a lunch in her honour. Mary returned to manage the lodge, answer mail and write newspaper articles and a manuscript about her trip. Her trip certainly wasn't the last time she would make the headlines. One day she came across a man stranded on a rock in the Taku River after his boat was wrecked in icy rapids. After rescuing him, she learned he was the famous glacier priest, Father Bernard Hubbard, who with a team of geologists had been studying glaciers in Alaska for several years. In 1938, she returned to her cinematic roots, appearing in a film that took place in the lodge and the surrounding wildernesses. It was called Orphans of the North and she played a character called Taku Mary. It wasn't long before she turned her hand to flying, becoming one of the first female pilots in Alaska. Her career as a bush pilot, however, was cut short when during an emergency landing in the Gastonuth Channel, her plane had a minor collision with a floating plane. While it ended her flight career, it certainly didn't end her interest in flight. She became a stewardess on Pan-Alaska Airlines at a time when only certified nurses could be stewardesses. Mary's experience with sled dogs proved extremely useful during World War II when the US Navy commissioned her to haul radio equipment by dog team. As the war progressed and the threat of Japanese invasion seemed imminent, they had already taken two Alaskan islands, she sold the Taku Lodge and moved to Junu. She also nursed at St Anne's Hospital during the war. Mary's Legacy she purchased the Top Hat Bar in Janu and won across the street which she renamed the Lucky Lady after herself as she claimed she was incredibly lucky. Here she entertained her customers, many of whom were politicians and government workers, a short walk away with tales of her adventures until she peacefully died in 1976. Mary Ellen Joyce was an independent person who marched to her own beat. This was uncommon at the time as women were expected to marry and raise a family. Mary was also from quite a poor background, and as the granddaughter of Irish immigrants, she really surpassed herself and showed people that regardless of your social class, you can still do anything. Mary had quite a lot of firsts. First female bush plane pilot in the region, first female radio operative in Alaska, and first non-native to travel the route from Junu to Fairbanks. Mary called her pub the lucky lady after herself, as she felt that she was an extremely lucky person. I am not sure it was luck. Perhaps just a little, but it was mostly hard work, determination and a little drop of curiosity that made up the person that was Mary Joyce.